Uh, so there we go. We are recording. And so in the future, if you want to go back and watch a video of me going through these notes, it's going to be posted right here in this Zoom meeting recording section on the circulatory system. And then if you want to ever go back and look through the notes that we go through today, again, um, on your own time, today is the 15th Tuesday. So we are going through the circulatory system notes today. So we're going to talk about blood. We're going to talk about the heart. We're going to talk about arteries and veins and all that cool stuff. All right, here we go. Circulatory system. As always, if you ever have any questions about anything as we're going through, please do not hesitate to either um, unmute yourself and just ask. When we get to kind of a pause point, you're more than welcome to do that. Or if you put it in the chat, I'll be checking on the chat pretty regularly and I'll try to get to your question as soon as I see it. So today, circulatory system, all about your heart moving your blood throughout your body. So the circulatory system is the different organs and tissues that are, are involved in transport. So circulation is all about transporting stuff, whether that's oxygen, blood cells, nutrients, water, it's all going through your arteries and veins in your body. So we're bringing things to the cells in order to get them the supplies that they need. And we're taking the waste out of the cells so we can remove it from our body at some point in the future. Sometimes on some of these slides or on some stuff that you look up, it might also be referred to as the cardiovascular system. That's just the same thing as the different name but same idea. Basically your heart and all of the arteries and veins that run throughout your entire body. So there are three major things that we want circulatory systems um, to have in them. There's got to be something that's carrying all of those nutrients and oxygen there's got to be a place for those things to go, and there's got to be something to pump all of that stuff through those vessels. So in a uh, human circulatory system, we've got blood is our fluid for transport, right? So the blood that's in your body is what's moving the stuff around. It's carrying it from one place to another. We've got the blood vessels. So the blood vessels are kind of like the highway of your body. All of the major nutrients and hormones and water and oxygen, all of that travels through the blood vessels, just like cars and trucks travel on the roads and highways. Nutrients and minerals travel through our blood vessels. And finally, we need an engine for this whole thing to go right. And in the case of humans and most other animals, that engine is a heart. So this little muscle right in the middle of your chest is responsible for moving all of the blood in your entire body throughout your entire circulatory system. So we've got a heart, the heart pumps the blood and the blood travels through the blood vessels, right? So the blood doesn't just like spurt everywhere inside of our body, right? If you have that going on, it's called internal bleeding and you've got some serious issues. Blood should only be traveling through these blood vessels. And I'll talk a lot more about those blood vessels a little bit later on tonight. So the blood is our carrying system. But what exactly is it carrying? So there are hormones, so things like adrenaline, testosterone, estrogen, that help to regulate the activity of our cells. They can make our cells very excited and active. They can make our cells more relaxed. 
They can activate the growth of different cells at different times, that sort of stuff. So that's one thing that's traveling in your blood. Oxygen, probably one of the most important things that travels in your blood. So the oxygen comes into your body and your lungs in a system we'll be talking about on Wednesday. But your arms and your legs aren't directly attached to your lungs. They're a little way away. So we need the blood to get that oxygen from your lungs to the rest of your body. There's also nutrients. So we've already talked about the digestive system, right? I mentioned how, especially in the intestines with those villi, the little weird fingery things, those are picking up the nutrients from your food and putting them in your blood. Once they're in your blood, then they need to get moved to all the other cells in your body. And that's what the circulatory system does. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that it'll transport, things like white blood cells to help fight infection and stuff like that. But these are some of the major ones, the most common things we find in our bloodstream. And again, they're all things that need to get from the place that they're produced, either in like the pituitary gland or the adrenal gland for hormones, from the lungs for oxygen, from the intestines for nutrients. They need to get there from or they need to move out from there to the rest of the body. And that's what all of our vessels in the circulatory system and all of our blood is doing, moving all that stuff all around. So our main pump, our only pump in vertebrates, so things with a spinal cord, like you, me, your dog, your cat, fish in the ocean, the birds in the air, they're all vertebrates. And in general, they have kind of two major areas of their hearts. So there's two different types of chambers. We've got the atria, or if you're just talking about one of them, it's an atrium. And so these are where the blood goes into the heart. So in a second, we'll look at the structure of the heart and we'll go into a whole lot of detail about heart, how the heart works. But if you ever see an area where the blood is going in, that is an atria. If you see somewhere where the blood is going out, those are called ventricles. So the atria and the ventricles are connected. The blood goes into the atria. The atria passes the blood into the ventricles, and then the ventricles push the blood out into the rest of the body or out to your lungs. And like I said, we'll talk a whole lot more in detail about this in about six minutes or so. But where blood goes in is the atria, and where blood comes out is the ventricles. So some animals have different structures to their heart. Some have two chambers, some have three chambers. In mammals, like humans, so that's what we're going to focus on, we have what's called a four-chambered heart. So one side of our heart contains all of the blood that's low in oxygen, and the other side of our heart contains all the blood that's high in oxygen. And if you ever see it on a drawing, like the ones that are on these slides. Blood that's low in oxygen usually is highlighted in blue, and blood that is high in oxygen is usually highlighted in red. This doesn't necessarily mean that if your blood is blue, that means it's low in oxygen. It does get a little bit kind of darker bluish than the normal blood, bright red blood that you might see if you like cut yourself but it's not like fully this blue or this red inside your body. We just color it that way to make it easier to tell what's low in oxygen and what's high in oxygen. And so mammals and most birds have a four chambered heart. So they have two chambers on the left hand side with the low oxygen and two chambers on the right hand side with the high oxygen. So humans, like I mentioned, four chambers for our heart. It's located right in the middle of your chest. So if you make a fist 
and put it right kind of in between, right on your sternum, your breastplate right here in the middle of your chest. That's where your heart is. I know sometimes when you're like in elementary school, you think, or people will say like it's more towards one side or the other. In reality, it's mostly, it's very centrally located, right in between your lungs, which are kind of right here. So the heart is obviously hollow because blood is gonna be going through it. And so in order to do that, in order to have those chambers, there's gotta be some hollowness inside. And your heart is pretty much entirely muscle, right? It is pumping literally every single second of every single day. If it ever stops pumping, you're in real big trouble, even if it only stops pumping for a couple seconds. That's very, very, very bad. So in order for all that pumping to happen, that's a lot of activity that your heart is doing. And so your heart is pretty much entirely made out of muscle tissue. And that's what allows it to have that contract and relax that it needs in order to pump all of your blood. So I mentioned that humans have a four chambered heart, two on the left side and two on the right side. And running in between the two sides of the heart is what's called a septum. So that septum is just sort of the middle dividing line of the heart. And then there's two chambers on one side and two chambers on the other. Now, if you're looking at this picture, you may notice something a little bit weird. It seems like it's mislabeled right? Because over here, as we're looking at this picture, this is our left as the viewer, but it's labeled as the right side. Same thing with the other side. It's labeled as the left side, but it seems like it's on the right side of the picture. That's because when we are talking about the heart, we are talking about the person's side of the body that the heart is inside. So if you imagine that there was a person around this heart, right? Here, let me see if this will sort of work for you guys. I apologize in advance for what you're about to see. My drawing skills are pretty awful. But like if we have like somebody and this is their arm and then this goes down to the body and then we have right here, and this is their other arm, and then they have a weird shoulder issue, but we're not gonna focus on that right now. And then up here is their head, right? And they're happy to see you because they're good buddies with you, even though they look like a monstrosity. If you're looking at this person over here, if you ask this guy to raise his right hand, he'd raise this side right? This is this guy's right side. Over here, this would be his left side. If you ask this guy to raise his left hand, he'd raise this hideously deformed appendage over here. So that's why on the heart, we have this side over here labeled as the right side, and this side over here labeled as the left side because we're thinking about it, we're pretending like we're looking at a heart that is inside of a human being. And in this human being, over here is their right, and over here is their left. So this is gonna be true of pretty much every heart picture that we look at in this class. So the right side of the heart is always gonna be the side that's over here on your left as the viewer, and the left side of the heart is always gonna be the part that's over here that seems like it's on your right as the viewer. Hopefully it'll become more clear as we look at more pictures of the heart. So I wanted to get that out right now before everybody becomes all confused about why I'm talking about the heart that's clearly on the wrong side. All right, boop, boop. So, Right side over here in blue, left side over here in red. And again, like I said, four chambers heart. So here's a chamber up here. Here's a chamber up here. 
here's one up here, and here's one down here. So if you remember when we were talking about earlier, the atria, these guys are up here, are where the blood goes into the heart. And then the ventricles, these guys down here, are where the blood comes out of the heart. So we have the septum dividing the heart in half, kind of going through the middle. Right side over here, left side over here, atrium up on the top, ventricles down on the bottom. So there's two atriums, or atria, excuse me, and two ventricles in a human heart. We've got the right and left atrium, as well as the right and left ventricle. So that's where the four chambers come from. We have two different chambers that are on the right side and two different chambers on the left side, giving us four in total. All right, so before we move on to the blood flow. Any questions about the structure of the heart so far? Anybody confused about the atrium, ventricles, left side, right side stuff? No. All right, thanks, Brenda. Doesn't look like there is anything in the chat either. So that is how the heart is structured. So next we're gonna talk about how does the blood actually move through the heart? What is kind of the job of each one of these chambers that we just talked about? So again, here we have human heart. This one's a little bit better quality. And so again, right side over here, this is the right side of this person's body and left side over here we've got our atrium and the top on the right and the left and we've got our ventricle on the bottom of the right and the left so how does blood go through the heart what does it look like when it's in these different stages and where does it go when it goes from one to another so the reason I have this highlighted so big up here is because this is going to be really important for not just us talking about today, but also um, this is going to be a lot about what your homework for today and tomorrow will be about as well. All right, so we're going to start over here on the right hand side of the heart. So first we have low oxygen blood from the body enters the right atrium up here. Because again, as the blood comes back into the heart, it's given away all the oxygen and nutrients in the blood. So it doesn't really have much more oxygen and nutrients left. And so the reason why it's coming back to the heart is so that it can get pumped out to the lungs and pick up some more of that sweet, sweet oxygen. So we have the low oxygen blood coming in to the right atrium. Again, the right side of the heart is our low oxygen side. Comes in to the right atrium through the superior vena cava up top. And it's not labeled on here, but there's the inferior one on the bottom. And so those guys are what's collecting all the blood from the body and pouring it into our right atrium. That blood then gets pumped when the heart pumps down into the right ventricle below. All right, so we've got our low oxygen from the body coming in to the right atrium. It then gets pumped down into the right ventricle. Then when the heart pumps again, the right ventricle will push that blood out of the heart and out to the lungs. So it's gonna go up through this blood vessel right here, which we'll talk about in more detail in a second. 
and go to the lungs because we want this to get oxygenated, right? We want all this low oxygen blood to get turned into high oxygen blood. And it'll only do that if it goes to the lungs. So the low oxygen blood comes in to the right atrium, gets pushed down to the right ventricle, and then gets pumped out towards the lungs. Once it goes out to the lungs and it picks up all that sweet, good oxygen, it then is gonna get parried back into the heart, into the left atrium. So remember, the left side of the heart is our high oxygen side. So now that we've been to the lungs and gotten lots of oxygen, we're gonna come back into the heart and enter the left atrium right here. So our blood goes to our body. It gives away all its oxygen. It comes back, enters the right atrium of the heart, goes down to the right ventricle of the heart, gets pumped out to go to the lungs, and then goes around the lungs, picks up some oxygen, and then enters back in the heart on the left side through the left atrium. So we go into the left atrium, go down from there into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle, the left side of the heart pushes the blood out through the aorta, which is the single biggest artery that comes out of your heart and branches off into all the other arteries that'll take blood to all the various areas of your body. And so the blood is carrying all of that good quality oxygen away from the heart, out of that left ventricle and to the rest of your body. So all of that high oxygen blood comes back to the heart, goes in to the left atrium over here, gets pumped down into the left ventricle on the bottom, and then that gets pumped out through the aorta and is being pumped around your entire body. Right? So our low oxygen bond from the body comes into the right side, goes through the atrium and ventricle, gets pumped out to the lungs, picks up some oxygen, comes back into the left side of the heart in the left atrium, goes down to the left ventricle, and then gets pumped out to the rest of your body. So one thing to note here, the right side of your blood, of your heart, excuse me, this guy only sends blood to your lungs, right? That's all he's got to do, send blood to your lungs and back. The left side of the heart is doing a lot more heavy lifting because he's pumping blood around your entire body. So until that blood goes all the way out and around through your body and then comes back around into the right side of your heart, that's what your left side of your heart is doing. So right side goes to the lungs, left side goes to the rest of the body. Any questions on how blood goes through the heart? Like I mentioned, this is gonna be kind of a major part of your homework for uh, the work today and tomorrow. So I wanna make sure that everybody feels pretty comfortable with this before we move on. All right, any heart or blood related questions so far? All right, let me check the chat really quick. Looks like nobody's got any questions going on in the chat either. All right, awesome. Glad that you guys are getting this so well. All right, so low oxygen blood in atrium, ventricle, out to the lungs, gets oxygen, comes back to the left side, atrium, ventricle, out to the rest of the body, loses its oxygen, comes back in to the right side, and completes the whole cycle over again. So I've been talking about how the heart pumps and sends the blood from one area to another, but it's not one single big pump every time. 
right? It's actually what's called a dual pump operation where we have a smaller pump and then a larger one. So if you've ever heard, like listen to somebody's heart on a stethoscope or heard like when movies use the heartbeat noise in order to create tension or something, right? It's not just one single like thum, thum, thum. Instead, it's usually more of like a doom, 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 doom. And that's because your heart goes through two pumps, a smaller one and a bigger one. So the first one is the smaller one, which is where the atria, after they fill up with blood, that first pump pushes the blood down into the ventricles. And so the atria basically kind of squeeze and push the blood into the ventricles down here. Then the second part, the dun dun, that is where the ventricles squeeze and push really hard and shoot all of that blood out of the heart to either the lungs, if we're going out the right side right here, or to the rest of the body, if we're going through the left side over here. So the atria contract, push the blood down, then the ventricles contract, push the blood out, and then third part, the heart relaxes and blood comes back into the atria and starts the cycle over again. So while this is happening, that's like the space between heartbeats, right? So we have our dun, dun, and then rest and the atria fill up, and then dun, dun, and then the atria fill up again. So we have this double pump action going on inside our heart to first get the blood from the atria to the ventricles, and then get the blood out of the ventricles into our body. All right, so when we talk about blood going to either our lungs or our body, we talk about it a little bit differently. This is like a super duper generalized version of it. Again, we have right side of the body and heart with low oxygen and left side of the heart with high oxygen. And so we refer to these two different kind of paths, these two circuits that the blood takes with different words. The pulmonary circuit relating to going to the lungs and the systemic circuit meaning going to the rest of your system, or in this case, it's the rest of your body. So pulmonary circulation is where heart, our heart sends the blood to the lungs, and then it goes back to the heart, right? This is where we're getting our oxygen from. So our pulmonary artery is what takes our blood out of that right ventricle and out to the lungs. So we'll talk about arteries and veins more in a little bit, but just as a brief overview, arteries are what take blood away from your heart. So your arteries are taking your blood. Those are what leave from the ventricles over here, right? That's carrying your blood away from your heart. If it's your pulmonary artery, it's taking it to your lungs. If it's your aorta, it's taking it to the rest of your body. Veins are vessels that take blood back into the heart. So it's going from your lungs or your body back in the direction of your heart. So in the case of our pulmonary circuit, we have the pulmonary arteries that go from heart to lungs. And then our pulmonary veins are what go from our lungs to our heart. That is our pulmonary circuit. It goes from our right ventricle out the pulmonary artery to the lungs, picks up some of that sweet, sweet oxygen, and then travels in the pulmonary veins from our lungs back into the left side of our heart. The left side of our heart then pumps our blood all the way through our body in what's called the systemic circuit. 
So once it leaves from our left ventricle, right? If you remember our left side of the heart is what is taking the blood out. Excuse me about that. Um, so we got our atrium and ventricles over here on the left that get that nice oxygen blood. And then the aorta is that main artery from the left. And that's carrying the blood out to our body. All right, so that left ventricle is doing a whole lot of work, pushing the blood up and around into our body cells. So these could be your stomach cells or your muscle cells or your kidney cells or your liver cells, any cells that need oxygen and nutrients, which is like all your cells. So once all of those oxygen and nutrients get dropped off, we pick up some waste products from the cells, we get low on oxygen, and then we travel back through the system of veins into the right side of our heart. So we start off as lots of little veins, kind of in our toes and our fingers, and then the closer we get to our heart, the more and more they bunch together until finally they kind of merge into two major sets of veins known as the vena cava. So there are two different vena cavas, one that comes down from your head and chest and one that comes up from the lower part of your body. And so the if you remember from way back the very first week of class, we talked about how anatomy, when we talk about things being superior, that means more upwards, more topwards, and inferior means being more underneath or more down. And that's what's happening with our vena cava right here. So we've got our superior vena cava that takes the blood back to our heart from our head and shoulders and arms. And then our inferior vena cava is what carries the blood from our legs and our abdomen up into our heart. So if we put this all together in one big loop, we come in to the right side of the heart in the vena cava. We go into the atrium, down into the ventricle, and then come out through the pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary is just a word referring to your lungs. And so the pulmonary artery goes to the lungs. We pick up lots of tasty oxygen. The pulmonary veins go back to the heart from the lungs. We go in the left atrium. We get pushed into the left ventricle and then we get pumped out through the aorta. That then splits off and takes blood all around the different areas of our body. We go out to the cells we drop off our oxygen, nutrients, pick up some CO2 and some waste, and the veins of our body collect all that waste and CO2 and carry it around, group up into the vena cava, and enter back in to the right side of the heart. So this is our circulatory system in a nutshell. How our heart moves blood through the different vessels to the areas that it needs to go to in our body. Um, so any questions about the, these different circulations, the pulmonary being the lung circulation and systemic being the body circulation. Any questions about those or these arteries and veins so far? Okie dokie then, moving on. All right, so like we were just saying, pulmonary circulation all about going to your lungs. So we're taking this low oxygen blood out to the lungs and then returning it back to the heart as high oxygen blood. That goes back around to the body where it loses its oxygen, and then it comes back around to the heart to complete the whole circuit over again. Right side of the heart, out to the lungs, and then back into the left side of the heart. That's what our pulmonary circuit is doing. 
our systemic circuit is going to everywhere else in the body that isn't our lungs, essentially. So all that oxygen and nutrients is making it out to our cells. So this aorta, it splits off into a whole bunch of different areas, either going up to our head and arms or down to our torso and legs. The blood drops off that oxygen and those nutrients, picks up some carbon dioxide and waste, and then comes back to the heart so it can go out to the lungs and pick up some more oxygen. So pulmonary circuit going to pick up oxygen from the lungs, systemic circuit going to drop off oxygen to our cells. All right, so moving from the heart and the major vessels around the heart to talking about some of those vessels in a little bit more detail, we can kind of group them into three major classes, two of which we've already talked about some, and one that we'll go over in just a second. So we have our arteries and arterioles. Um, arterioles being essentially a fancy word for really, really small arteries. Same thing with our veins and our venules. Again, these are just very, very small veins. And then capillaries is a kind of specialized area where our arteries and our veins meet up with each other. And so the capillaries are usually where this cells of our body actually interact with these blood vessels. And we'll talk more about capillaries in just a couple minutes. So if we were to take all of your blood vessels in your body and lay them out in a single line end to end, there would be over 80,000 miles of blood vessels carrying blood around your body. Obviously, most of these are super duper tiny, microscopically small, but there are still tons and tons of vessels throughout your body. So we've already talked about them a little bit, but again, just to reiterate, arteries are blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. So I always like to remember it as arteries are going away from the heart, A to A, arteries are away. So whether this is going to your lungs or to your system cells, they're all arteries that are moving away from your heart. If your blood is going back towards your heart, that means it's going through a vein. So it's going from either your lungs or your body back into your heart. And then finally, we have the capillaries. And these are essentially, if arteries and veins were very small, capillaries are even more teeny tinier. Some of them, the smallest capillaries, can be so small that they're literally one cell wide. Cells have to line up one at a time in order to pass through them. So these are essentially the tiny tubes that connect your arteries to the cells of your body and then back to your veins. And so when our blood is full of oxygen and nutrients, it basically gives those to our cells by passing very, very close to our cells and they exchange the oxygen and nutrients for the waste in the cells. And that exchange generally happens in capillaries. So they're small enough so that those blood cells can get really, really, really close to your body cells. Then after that exchange happens, the capillaries carry that blood into your veins so that it can go back to your heart so that it can get sent out to get more oxygen in your lungs. So arteries are where we're going away from the heart. Veins are where we're going back to your heart. Um, one way that I sometimes kind of remember it is that veins have this IN in here because the blood is going in to your heart. So arteries are going away from your heart. Veins are going in to your heart. This is kind of what it looks like if we were to look at an area 
where veins and arteries are meeting up through those capillaries. So we have this high oxygen blood coming from the heart, away from the heart in our arteries, that then gets really close to our body cells in our veins. You can kind of see that more down here. We have blood coming down the artery, splitting off from the artery and going through all these little capillaries in the middle here in order to drop off that oxygen and nutrients. Those capillaries then group up and carry all of that low oxygen blood into the veins, which will kick that blood back towards the heart. All right, so a little bit more about arteries and veins. Um, so arteries and veins, actually, it's not just a simple tube that's carrying the blood. They actually are ringed in muscle. So it's a type of muscle called smooth muscle that we'll talk about later on when we're talking about the muscular system. And this muscle is what helps the arteries and veins to kind of expand and contract as the blood gets pumped through them, right? Because our blood isn't like constantly circulating, right? It's not like a jet in a machine or something. Our heart is pumping, so our blood is getting pushed in waves, right? So it's not just constantly moving like water through a hose. Instead, it's being pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And so the muscles in our arteries and veins help them to kind of relax when they're being pushed so that they don't get overstretched. And then it helps them to kind of reform after the push so that they're still maintaining the shape that they're supposed to be. So arteries have a lot of muscle because they're coming pretty close out of the left side of the heart, so they're getting a lot of push going in on them. And again, arteries are away from the heart. Then when our arteries and veins are meeting up, we have these capillaries, which are generally super thin and tiny. And because they're only one cell thick, the cells have to line up kind of one at a time in order to go through them. So like here's a super crazy enhanced image of red blood cells passing through these tiny, tiny capillaries one by one. So normally you can fit thousands of blood cells through like an artery or a vein at a time, right? It's just like a constant, like a hose rush of cells. But once you get to these capillaries, they've got to slow down and can only go one by one through this area. This makes it a lot easier for the blood cells to give oxygen and nutrients to the body cells and reversely for the body cells to give wastes and carbon dioxide to the blood cells. And then once that oxygen and nutrients gets dropped off, we've got our veins, which are carrying our blood back to our heart after that oxygen and nutrients gets used up. So they have a little bit thinner walls and arteries. The pressure in the veins isn't quite as intense as it is in the arteries because um, they're kind of the second half of the journey. So they're just carrying everything back up and more towards the center of your body in order so that it can get back into your heart and go out to your lungs and get that oxygen once again. All right, before we get to the next section, any questions on arteries, veins, or capillaries so far? What do they do? Where are they taking blood? Anything like that? Any questions so far? All right, doesn't sound like it. So next up is we mentioned I mentioned a little bit ago that there is a lot of force that is being put on your blood vessels as the blood is going through them as your heart is pumping. And 
You may not realize it, but doctors are actually measuring this force all the time when you go in for a checkup or if you have to go into the hospital or something. Because most people know this force as its more medical term, term which would be your blood pressure. So as your blood is being constantly pumped through your body, it's putting some pressure against those walls, right? If you have a hose with no water in it, then it's kind of flat and floppy, right? But if you crank open the spigot, then the hose gets filled up and you can feel the pressure on the inside of the hose, right? Similar thing is going on with your blood pressure. Your blood is a liquid that's moving through those veins and arteries. And so as it moves and as it gets pumped and pushed through there, it exerts some pressure on those artery walls and vein walls, which is why those guys have a little bit of muscle inside of them to help contain some of that pressure. So whenever you hear a doctor or a nurse read your blood pressure, you might say like, oh, look at that, 127 over 82 or 110 over 76. It's always like big number over small number. So the big number refers to what's called your systolic pressure. And the small number refers to the diastolic pressure. So systolic pressure is when your heart is contracting. So at its maximum like pump or push, right? Your ventricles are being squeezed and your blood is being pushed. That's the kind of high range of the pressure of the blood inside of your arteries and veins. And so that's why it gives you a higher number because the heart is really exerting itself. And so the blood is being pushed against those artery walls. And so that's your systolic pressure, your pumping pressure. Diastolic is when in between heartbeats, when you have the doom doom and then the space as your left and right atria fill up with blood. That's sort of the resting pressure of the blood inside of your veins and arteries. So when your blood is not being pushed, when it's not currently being squeezed through those blood vessels, then it's still filling up that space. It's still exerting liquid pressure on the inside of those tubes, but it's not being pumped or pushed, so it's a more lower relaxed pressure. So systolic is higher pumping pressure, diastolic is lower relaxed pressure. And that's why you get big number over little number. So this is kind of what we just talked about. You'll have your systolic pressure, higher number of what the pressure is when your heart is pumping and contracting, and then diastolic when your heart <sighs> relaxes between the beats of your heart. So if you ever want to know, like if your if the nurse or doctor reads out your heart, your blood pressure, and you're not sure if it's good or bad, the general number that you're kind of hoping to shoot for is 120 over 80. So a systolic pressure of 120 and a diastolic pressure of 80 are considered like the most like middle of the road normal ranges for your blood pressure. Usually it's not going to be exactly that. It might be like 124 over 83 or 116 over 72. Anything in that kind of close to 120 over 80 range, pretty good, pretty A-OK. -okay. If you start getting systolic readings of like 140 and 150, and diastolic of like 90 or 100. Or if you have low blood pressure, so that would be like high blood pressure, right? Low blood pressure would be if your systolic is around like 100 and your diastolic is around like 50, 60. All right, those numbers would be what caused the nurse or the doctor to become a little bit concerned that something isn't quite right with either your heart or your blood vessels. All right, so we've spent a lot of time so far talking about the heart, which is that muscle that pumps the blood, and the vessels, 
those tubes that the blood goes through, but we haven't talked a whole lot about the blood itself. So blood is kind of a very general word that refers to a whole bunch of stuff all together. So it's a mixture of some solids like these cells and a large amount of liquid called plasma. So the liquid part of your blood is the blood plasma. That's kind of what's carrying all of the blood cells with their oxygen and nutrients and stuff for your body. So like whenever you donate plasma or you hear people talk about needing plasma donations, this is what they're doing. They're taking the liquid part out of your blood without getting to your blood cells themselves. So your blood is mostly made out of water. Most of the liquid in your blood is water. And that's what makes up the plasma. And so the nutrients, the blood cells, the hormones, all of that is carried along by the plasma as your heart is pumping. The most common type of cell in your blood vessels is your red blood cells. So these guys are super duper duper important because these are your oxygen carriers, right? These guys in here are red blood cells. They have a very distinctive kind of like almost donut sort of shape. And so these guys are what capture the oxygen from your lungs and then drop off the oxygen at your cell body cells, right? So these guys are sort of like the postal workers or like the Amazon delivery trucks of your body. They go to your lungs, which is like the oxygen warehouse, fill up on oxygen, and then go and travel all over your body and drop off the oxygen at the cells that they are taking it to. So these guys are far and away the most common type of blood cell in your blood because we need a whole lot of them because we need a whole lot of oxygen circulating around our body. So we've got some red blood cells, but we have some other types of cells in your blood too. It's not just plasma and red blood cells. You can also have white blood cells, which would be uh, these orangey kind of guys right here. These are part of your immune system. And so these are what fight off germs and viruses that get into your body. So if your immune system detects that you have some foreign bacteria entering through a cut in your skin, your white blood cells will travel through your blood system and kind of swarm that area to fight off your infection. So they're kind of like one of your first lines of defenses in your body against foreign stuff trying to get in. There's also these little purple guys all around here. And these guys are called platelets. So normally on a normal day, if you don't really get injured or hurt in any way, platelets don't have a whole lot to do. They just kind of float around in your blood. But say you're chopping up onions for dinner or something and oh, ouch, you get a little cut on your finger. It starts bleeding a little bit. You run it under some water and rinse it off, maybe stick a Band-Aid on it. And a couple hours later, you can pull off that Band-Aid and the bleeding will have stopped. Maybe it starts to form a little bit of a scab. The platelets are what are actually clumping up at that wound, at that cut in your finger, and helping to slow down and eventually stop the blood flow and blood loss. So they start clotting that blood up in that wound, which eventually is what leads to the scab and prevents too much blood from leaving your body. So for most people, getting like a small or even a medium-sized cut on your arm or your leg would be painful, it would suck, but it's not really a super dangerous or life-threatening injury, right? It's not like your whole thing got chopped off or something. Some people though have really low platelet counts Either maybe they're taking blood thinners or they have a disease that stops them from producing platelets. For them, getting even a small cut on their body could be potentially fatal because if you don't have enough platelets, 
and you don't stop the bleeding of the wound, the blood's not going to clot up. It's just going to keep bleeding out and bleeding out and bleeding out. And if you don't do anything to stop it, you could eventually get to the point where you lose too much blood and your body starts to shut down. So while they may not be active all the time, platelets are extremely useful in terms of helping us recover from injuries, especially things like cuts or scrapes that we get on our hand. Basically anything that causes bleeding, you need platelets to go there clot it all up and stop your body from losing too much blood. So we've got our red blood cells, these weird donut looking things carrying oxygen. We've got our white blood cells that are on the alert for any intruders and ready to fight off any attackers. And we've got our platelets that are ready to all swarm over a wound should you get cut or scraped on your skin. Yeah. All right, let me see if there's anything else about these cells that I super wanted to mention. So yeah, red blood cells, extremely, incredibly common. 99% of the cells in your blood are red blood cells. So the platelets, the white blood cells, they only make up about 1% of the cells. 99 out of 100 cells in your blood are red blood cells. Again, because we have a lot of oxygen need in our body. All of our body cells need oxygen all the time. So we need billions and billions of red blood cells in our body to make sure that we can keep up with that oxygen demand. So yeah, white blood cells are our defenders. They can recognize cells that are not supposed to be in your body. So all the cells in your body have certain proteins. So we talked about proteins when we talked about these macromolecules. One of the things that proteins do is they act as little identifiers on the outside of your cells, on that lipid layer that covers and protects the cells. So all the cells in your body have certain proteins that allow the red blood cells to recognize, hey, this is a Mr. Stanley cell, and this is a Mr. Stanley cell, and this is a Mr. Stanley cell. But other bacteria and viruses, like these little E. coli bacteria on this picture, they do not have those special proteins. So your immune system cells, like your red, white blood cells, should be able to fairly quickly be like, uh-oh, intruder alert, you're not supposed to be here. You do not belong in this body. And so that's what allows them to recognize and attack the correct types of cells. And it prevents them from just waging war on the cells in your own body. And then platelets, again, are our blood clotting cells. And so they work by forming like this cool kind of mesh barrier between the platelets. So the platelets are these little yellow kind of corn looking things in here. And essentially, whenever they reach an area where there is an open cut or an open wound, they start making all of these fibers in between them. And all those fibers kind of help start trapping and holding in your red blood cells. And so it prevents them from too much blood from exiting your body and creating a dangerous kind of bleed out situation. So we've got our heart that's pumping low and high oxygen blood all around our body, either out to the lungs or out to everywhere else in our body. We've got the arteries carrying the blood away from our heart. We've got veins carrying blood back towards into our heart. We've got our capillaries, those tiny, tiny itty bitty tubes where the blood goes through one by one in order to drop off the oxygen and nutrients and pick up CO2 and waste. And then in that blood itself, we have our red blood cells, which are carrying the oxygen all around our body. We have the white blood cells, which are like the warriors, the fighters, the invader attackers. And then we have our little platelet cells, which clump up and prevent too much bleeding going on if you happen to get a cut somewhere on your skin or inside your body. And I think that will take us just about to the end of the notes for today. 
All right. Any kind of final wrap up questions about any of the different parts of our circulatory system? The heart, the vessels, the blood, anything like that. Anything that you want me to go back through or give a little bit more detail on. All right, no questions on the call and it doesn't look like we've got any questions in the chat. So just as a reminder, if you ever wanna go back and look at those notes on your own, you can go back to our Google Classroom and they're going to be, that's the wrong Google Classroom. They're gonna be under the 915 Tuesday note section under the circulatory week three system. So right here, these are our notes from today. And so the homework for today and tomorrow should be hopefully pretty straightforward. It's basically just a bunch of labeling some of the different parts of the circulatory system that we talked about today. So the assignment for today, which again, since you're on the Zoom call right now, you already got your attendance credit for today. So if you wanna hold off and do this assignment sometime later on in the week, you are more than welcome to. But the one that got posted today has this big diagram of a heart right here, which if you remember, we have the right side of the heart over here and the left side of the heart over here because we're looking at it as if we're pretending like it's inside of someone's body. And so it just has eight different labels, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And so down here or on the Google Doc, it's also right under the picture, you're just going to name each one of these labels with one of the parts of the heart listed up here at the top. So you're just matching up right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, vena cava, and aorta with one of these eight labels down here. So that is the Tuesday assignment. And then for the Wednesday assignment, it's something very similar, only instead of focusing on the blood, or excuse me, instead of focusing on the heart, it focuses more on those pulmonary and systemic circuits, right? So it's very similar. We have our heart right here, only now we've kind of extended it out into the different circuits. So we've got one going out to these big structures over on either side of the heart. We've got part of it going up to the heads and arms region up top and then part of it going down to our kind of abdominal organs and our legs below. But overall, same general structure as the other worksheet where we have A through H arrows over here and down here. And for each one of them, you're going to label based on these titles up here. So matching the aorta, the pulmonary artery, the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, the heart, the pulmonary vein, the right lung, and the left lung to one of these labeled arrows on the picture right here. All right, so again, since you came to the Zoom meeting today, you don't have to do the Tuesday assignment until later on if you don't want, but please make sure to do an assignment sometime tomorrow so that you're able to get your Wednesday attendance credit before we meet again on Thursday night. Any final questions about the circulatory system or about the homework that we have coming up in the next couple days? All righty.